All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining the latest apiculture webinar through the NC State uh, University Apiculture Program. My name is David Tarpey. I'm a professor of entomology here in the uh, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Extension Apiculturist uh, for the state of North Carolina. And uh, this is um, uh, along the, the regular webinar series that we've been holding going on four years now. I, I couldn't believe that um, in looking up on our website that uh, the very first webinar that we held was, was four years ago this September. So um, we've been doing these regularly uh, three or four times a year uh, and they've been um, really successful in um, being able to interact with uh, beekeeper groups and individual beekeepers all across the state simultaneously. So it's a really great way to virtually bring everybody together. I want to particularly thank uh, the Surrey County beekeepers. So what started out um, as an option to go and talk to an individual bee club, um, what's caught on with this webinar series is um, local chapters are virtually hosting these uh, webinar events on their usual um, evening meeting times. And so this evening, our, uh, our gracious hosts are the Surrey County Beekeepers in the northwest of the, of the state. Um, and so thank you all for, for joining us, Surrey County Beekeepers. We're also joined by the Caldwell County Beekeepers, uh, the Pickens County, Pickens County Beekeepers in, in South Carolina, uh, Allegheny County, um, Sampson County and Tar River Beekeepers as well. So um, thank you all for, for coming. It's a really great turnout and I appreciate all of you uh, that have joined individually as well as, as a club. So again, uh, to take advantage of this live uh, format, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to chime in by turning on your talk button in the upper left hand corner or you can um, type in your question in the chat window in the lower left hand corner and I'll try and get to those. Uh, but excuse me if I don't get to it right away because sometimes it, it, uh, it may not ca catch my eye right away. So Now what um, has been tradition in the last uh, two or three years of this webinar is that typically at the end of the summer, really the beginning of the academic school year, so we're kind of you know full-fledged into our semester, fall semester already, it's a really great time to reflect and think about what we did this past summer. And so as you well know, um, beekeeping is really, really busy in the spring and through the summer. And now we're kind of winding down and, and getting the, the mites controlled and getting the, the colonies ready for the winter. And so the same is very much true for honeybee research where we're incredibly busy during the spring and the summer. And by the end of the summer, around this time of year, we're finally sitting down and, and looking at our data and analyzing those numbers and trying to figure out and to see how, how well things went, uh, went this summer. Um, but rather than giving a general overview of all of the different research projects that we have going on in the lab, um, I decided to just focus on a, a small subset of those projects. And that's not um, to dismiss some of the other great work that's going on. Is that at last count, we have 46 different experiments that we were running this past summer at some level and capacity. And so it's just not enough time to really give them all due justice. Um, and so what I thought we'd do is uh, talk about a little bit about some of the work that we have going on with uh, our studies in feral honeybees as well as um, beekeeping in urban habitats, or really how urbanization affects bees and beekeeping. Um, and so this was uh, done in uh, while talking with the Surrey County beekeepers, and they thought that this would be um, a very good uh, topic, especially this time of year, and given some of the, the latest research that, that has been coming out from our program. So. Uh, before I get to that, I do uh, quickly want to mention a couple uh, brief announcements, and I'm sure there's others, if others want to chime in here, about upcoming events. Not only is this a busy time for kind of winding down our research, but it's also an extremely busy time for a lot of outreach uh, activities. And uh, two of the, of the annual, some of the biggest annual outreach activities um, that, that we're involved with are uh, Bug Fest, which um, is held in, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, this upcoming Saturday, 
Um, so if something like 20,000 people attend the uh, um, Museum of Natural Sciences downtown Raleigh uh, for free, and there's uh, lots of, of booths dealing with insects and, and general outreach dealing with insects. But we always have a booth there, and several of the local beekeeper clubs have booths there as well. So it's really a, a great fun-filled uh, day uh, filled with activities. And then, of course, don't forget the uh, State Fair, the NC State Fair um, in October, 10 days in the middle of October every single year. The North Carolina Department of Agriculture and the Apiary Inspection Program, Don Hopkins and his team, just really go all out every single year in collaboration with the local uh, county clubs of the NCSBA and putting on a, an excellent display, just the, uh, the best in the nation, really, uh, when it comes to the state fairs. Uh, concurrent with that, or uh, around the same time, you know, we have the Mountain State Fair, there's the Dixie Classic, there's a lot of others uh, around the state, uh, and uh, in addition to the, the county fairs as well. So be sure to, to go out and support your local beekeepers by going to the booths and, and, um, and supporting their outreach activities. Another quick announcement, if I can, um, uh, dealing with our, uh, uh, our bees network, the beekeeper education and engagement system. So if you're not, if you're, if you're amenable to this online environment and this idea of kind of getting beekeeping education through the internet and interacting with each other online, uh, then the Bees Network may be a, a good option for you. Um, this is something, again, that we, has been going on for several years now that we've been uh, offering these mini courses online uh, on different aspects of uh, honeybee biology, of bee management, and the honeybee industry. Um, and these are all online and, and have been for, for quite some time. Uh, the, the, the actual infrastructure of these courses has migrated to the Distance Education and Learning Technology Administrative event, uh, um, a branch of NC State campus. And so they bring a, a huge wealth of um, professionalism and resources for online learning. Uh, and so with this new migration to this new uh, kind of umbrella of distance ed learning, um, the Delta folks are looking for three county tra chapters where they want to kind of do a test run of working with local chapters to do an advanced B school. I know there's a lot of uh, beginner B schools out there all across the state every single year, and they're always very important to, um, to recruitment and to uh, local club activities. But there's really pretty much a, a paucity of, of advanced, more advanced, uh, B schools for those that get into the second, third, fourth year of beekeeping and really want to take their beekeeping to the next level. Uh, and so we're willing to work with um, different county chapters who would like to develop in collaboration with us um, a, an advanced bee school that is befitting of, of what their uh, local beekeepers are looking for. So if you're interested at all in, in uh, partnering with us on this, please contact me uh, and we'll be happy to, to set something up. Okay, so given that, um, I want to, uh, before I really talk about uh, the research about feral bees and uh, urban bees, um, I want to acknowledge the main collaborators that we've been working with on these various projects. So again, science has never done in a vacuum. Uh, and so it's really, really important to uh, bring different uh, minds, different people, different uh, um, perspectives together in order to accomplish a, a lot of this type of science. And so uh, I want to give a shout out to all of these individuals, most notably um, a former master's student in our lab, Holden Appler, um, who graduated this past year with his master's degree uh, looking at the effects of urbanization on uh, honeybee immunology. <laughs> Continuing that work uh, to this day is a, is a new postdoc in our lab, uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, um, Lopez Uribe. Um, uh, Margarita has joined us this past summer, um, and she brings a huge wealth of expertise in population genetics and especially on native bees, so not just honeybees, uh, but native bees as well. Um, I also want to um, We'll be talking about um, this ongoing collaboration with Dr. Debbie Delaney, who was a postdoc in our lab 
uh, starting six years ago, but she's been at the University of Delaware in her own faculty position for the last uh, four years now, uh, but our collaboration continues. Um, and with her work, we've also been working with Dr. Tom Seeley at um, uh, Cornell University. We'll, we'll be talking about the bees, the feral bees in upstate New York where he's located. And then finally, two other collaborators in our department, uh, Dr. Steve Frank, who is um, a fellow faculty member here in the entomology department. He um, works on ornamental entomology and different aspects of kind of um, applied ecology, specifically looking at um, uh, the effects of urbanization on different insect populations. And he was the co-advisor with Holden. Um, and so one of his postdocs, Dr. Elsa Youngstead, who's been doing um, a lot of really great work along these same lines, too. So uh, collaboratively, with all these different projects, um, these are the folks, and then a small cadre of undergraduates that assisted them in their um, research was really, really important to make this happen. Of course, the funding to actually support these postdoctoral and student positions had to come from somewhere. Um, and so that came from uh, the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, for the work that I'll be talking about that we did with Debbie uh, and Tom. Uh, it also came from uh, the NCDA and the NCSBA that both supported individuals um, and supplies to actually do this work. And then um, uh, a fairly large grant from an internal grant from the Dean's Enrichment uh, Foundation, which is an, a new um, internal granting opportunity um, that has also been um, instrumental in, in making a lot of this happen. So with all the, the thank yous um, up front, I want to talk then a little bit about these different projects. So this issue of managed bees versus feral bees um, may not seem all that important to beekeepers because, you know, we don't really deal with, with the feral bees unless we're catching the swarms out of the woods and, you know, it's kind of a source of free bees for us. But I would argue that it's really important to understand the distinction between managed bees, that is bees that we have in our boxes, versus non-managed or feral bees that are not. They're living in other places. And so these distinctions become very important when it comes to bee biology and the subsequent things that happen, such as the uh, levels of disease that they may get. So to compare and contrast, managed bees, they live in our boxes. And you may not realize it, but the, um, the average feral nest that um, if you go out and you find, you know, bees living in trees, the average cavity that they live in, in hollowed out trees, tends to be about 40 meters, give or take, you know, depending on, on just how the, the tree was hollowed out. But a single 40 liter volume is a single Langstroth uh, brood box that we have on our bee colonies. So, you know, typical honey, managed honeybee colonies have two of those brood boxes and then honey supers on top of that. So our managed beehives are, you know, two to five times larger than what you would find in nature, just because of the constraints of where the bees are able to take up their residence, okay? So the distinction of the honeybee colonies um, just between the managed and the non-managed is sheer size, the sheer population of bees. Another thing, because uh, we as beekeepers are actively working with our bees, we, we very much actively deter swarming, right? We don't want the bees to swarm because they're gonna, we're not going to make a very good honey crop um, from, uh, you know, from the bees leaving. So we actively try to keep them as strong as possible without them leaving, right? That's part, that's part of the art and the dance of, of beekeeping that we all conduct every year. Whereas in non-managed situations, they're swarming at will. They swarm whenever they want. So they're constantly splitting, and they're swarming a lot more than, than they do when they're in our boxes. Um, and again, usually because they're in smaller, confined spaces. Another thing that beekeepers do is they help control pests and diseases. And you know, there's all sorts of different ways that that can happen. Uh, but staying on top of these different um, parasites and pathogens is is really um, something that's very important for beekeepers. But of course, non-managed bees, bees that are living on their own in the wild, 
Um, they don't have that pest control at all. Uh, they're up to their own devices. One last thing that uh, we as beekeepers can do is we can manage the genetics. We can actually control what type of queen goes into our colony, and we can change that. Um, and that's a very powerful uh, managerial practice that, that we do. Whereas uh, in, in nature, you know, the colonies, their turnover of genetics is just, uh, they, they, they don't have um, the ability to, to change their genetics. They're just um, you know, living in the wild. And so um, those differences, I think, are really, really important because um, as we see, we, we all know every single year we're losing, you know, 30 percent, about a third of our colonies that we're managing every single year. Um, whereas in the wild, um, there are reports of, of, you know, bee colonies that can live for many, many years at a time. I mean, it's mostly anecdotal, but um, you talk to enough beekeepers, you'll hear of, you know, these wild honeybee colonies living in trees for years and years at a time seemingly without dying out at all. And so um, really the question is, how are they able to survive? How are they able to manage um, in face of all the problems that we as beekeepers are facing? And so if we can learn a little bit from what's going on in these uh, non-managed colonies, we might be able to glean some information of how they're able to do it and then co-opt those methods to manage bees uh, to help improve survival. So the other aspect here is um, the effects of urbanization on bees. So, you know, urbanization, as you, as you well know, is kind of an increasing trend. Uh, we just recently, within the last few years, went from a majority of the human civilization on the entire planet living in rural areas to now the majority of the human civilization are living in large urban centers. And that trend is only going to increase going forward uh, for the next century as, as far out as they predict. And so this interface of how um, urbanization affects the environment and how that uh, environment affects um, beneficial insects such as honeybees is really, really important to understand. Um, and it's also an increasing trend, of course, as there are a lot of urban beekeepers now. Um, so the question is, um, you know, does that pose uh, challenges to keeping bees in these urban areas. And you may, you know, obviously think of this skyline of, um, of Shanghai here, you, may, you obviously you may think of urbanization as, as a bad influence in the sense that there's lots of air pollution, all this particulate matter, um, things that give us asthma and you know, all the smog and everything is also not very healthy for bees. There's um, heavy metals in the environment as well from, from exhaust and, and burning of fossil fuels. There's also this urban heat island effect, right, where all of the concrete tends to absorb the, the sunlight during the day and then radiate it back at night. And so in large urban centers, they tend to be 10 degrees Celsius higher than the areas around them. And that's, that's a huge discrepancy in, in the temperature. And so it can be too hot for bees sometimes in these, uh, in these urban, urban heat islands. There's also a very nice paper published this year by um, uh, uh, Reed Johnson and his uh, master's students um, from Ohio State University where they showed um, the uh, pr proportion of the urban land uh, cover. So that is on this, uh, on this axis here, the further right you go, the more urban it gets. And then on the y-axis here is how much food, how much the frames of honey that different beekeepers had um, within their hives. And so what they showed is a significant downward trend so that the more urban the landscape, the less honey those colonies tended to make. Now, it's a lot of scatter, uh, but it, um, it definitely shows the potential that urban landscapes are not as conducive for, uh, for honeybees. Now, that said, there could be some benefits to urbanization as well. So um, whereas the urban, urban heat island effect um, can be problematic by making it too hot in the summertime, it can make it so that it's not too cold in the wintertime, so that the bees 
uh, may not have as, as much of a difficulty overwintering, especially in climates you know further up north. So you know that that's a, a double uh, the, the two sides to that particular coin. It's also true that you know while high levels of heavy metals and all these other things can be problematic, um, bees do need some of these micronutrients, and so um, you know they're not necessarily bad. The toxicity really comes down to the dose, right? Um, and another thing that urban areas tend to have, um, out, out in uh, rural areas, there tends to be large ab abundance of flowers, uh, but they may not be as diverse as in the cities. So uh, other studies have shown that you know, humans like to plant flowering things all year long. Um, and so there could be a diversity of different blooms that um, exist all year round. Whereas uh, in, in uh, natural areas, uh, especially here in, in the summer in North Carolina, things just get so hot that a lot of, um, a lot of things dry up and so aren't in bloom out in, in, in the rural areas where they may be in bloom in, uh, in city areas. There's a, a question here about are bees living in a building considering a feral colony? So um, that's, what, that's a good question. Um, and that's why I made this distinction of non-managed, uh, because it is kind of a gray area, right? So bees living in our boxes where we're going in there and manipulating the hive, that's clearly a managed colony, right? But if those bees swarm and they go and live in, in a hollowed out tree or in a building or somewhere, um, you know, one day later, they're not, you know, fully feral yet, right? They haven't kind of acclimated or adjusted to their surrounding environment. But if they're living in that same area for, say, 10 years, then clearly they are, right? So it really kind of depends on how long do they have to be outside of our boxes, outside of our control, for them to be considered feral, right? So and that's a very gray area, um, and, and how do we determine that, right? So um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but I think that the feral bees are clearly those that have readapted and, and become wild living. Uh, but um, exactly how long that has to take to become feral versus just recently escaped swarms is yet to be determined. That's a good question. So, so because of that, that these, are the, these are the real questions that are kind of driving a lot of this research when it comes to both looking at feral bees and to looking at the effects of urbanization. Because um, it, it really does affect all of us, right? So, to, to that point that was that was just asked, or that question that was just asked, um, are these non-managed bees that are living outside um, of our box, are they um, survivor stock? That is, are they bees that have survived and persisted in the wild for a very long time, or did they all get wiped out and then? You know, these bees that are not living in our boxes, or they just escape swarms. Now, I'm sure it's not from any of your bees. I'm sure it's your neighbor beekeeper's bees that are swarming, right? Because none of our bees swarm. Um, but, you know, these escape swarms do happen from time to time. And so, are they just kind of repopulating this non managed niche out there, but then they're dying off because of varroa mites and other problems as well? So, that's an important distinction to ask to see if are they really persisting or are they just being repopulated, right? Um, if they are just being repopulated all the time from our managed stock, then they're really not a genetic resource for our managed bees, right? Because ge genetically they're the same. But if they are a survivor population, that is they are somehow genetically distinct from the bees that we tend to buy and manage in our beehives, then again, th that distinction, that difference, may be partly to explain why they're able to survive and therefore they can be a good genetic resource for us, right? So those are some of the questions that we've been asking about the feral bees. On the urbanization side of things, um, it's really asking are urban environments good or bad for bees? Because again, it's kind of equivocal as to whether um, urbanization it has an overall negative or an overall positive effect because there seems to be elements of both. Um, similar to that, are, what are the factors of the urban landscape that are most critical 
um, and, and most affect uh, honeybee colonies? Is it the foraging availability? Is it the temperature? Is it um, different aspects working on their uh, immune systems and, and the likelihood of disease? All of these different things can be affected by the urban landscape. And um, if so, which ones are more important and how do they affect our bees? Um, and that's really getting you know, to the ultimate question, are, are beekeepers doing more harm than good when they keep bees in urban areas versus in rural areas? Um, and that's something that would be very nice to, uh, to understand so that beekeepers can uh, respond accordingly. Okay, so um, so the the question about you know escape swarms, um, whether or not they're truly feral, uh, I I think that that's a very difficult one because it is this kind of gray area. Well, the best way to avoid that kind of gray area is to go to a place where it's totally black and white, right? And so this is where Tom Seeley comes in, where he's been studying this population of feral bees in the Arnott Forest in upstate New York in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's a really, really remote region in upstate New York. And he's been studying them since his doctoral dissertation in the 1970s. Um, this was before Varroa was introduced to the continent, right? So he was studying them before Varroa, and he's been studying them since Varroa, um, and they're still there. And so if there's any population that is putatively truly feral <laughs> and, and uh, supposedly a uh, survivor population of bees living on their own, this is this. Um, and so what he's done, and he's actually done, he does this every single year because bees, bee colonies still in this population, they die out and they reestablish in other places. Um, he goes into this 4,200-acre uh, forest and he, find, he finds patches of flowers where honeybees are actively foraging. And then he uses this bee lining technique, which um, I don't know uh, if anybody's ever heard or seen this, but it's a really uh, powerful technique that people have been doing since, well, prehistoric times, where you capture bees foraging at the flowers and you watch them fly back to their home. They make a beeline back to their nest, right? Then when they return, you put them in a box and you move them, say, 100 feet in one direction, and you let them go again, and they make, again, another beeline to their hive. And then you can triangulate based on the different vectors of where they're going. And then you kind of go closer and closer and closer until you find these bee trees. And it can take days, if not weeks, to locate through this triangulation technique of bee lining to find where their actual hive is. Um, and they can be very cryptic, um, you know, 50 feet yeah, under the tree and just at this little notch. Um, and it can be very, very difficult to find these. And so, Tom, every what? single fall, he goes out and he locates um, these uh, these bee trees in the Arnott Forest. Is there a question? What are you going to do? I'm sorry? We're almost done with the scanning thing. Okay. Oh, you have to get done. Okay. Go, uh, go ahead and, and mute your, um, your mic or your telephone. Um, uh, or if there's a question, you can ask it or uh, or type it in if you're on if you're online. So anyway, so um, Tom goes through and um, he's, he found uh, ten of these bee trees in this forest. So that's that's really not a very high density, right? Some of us have ten beehives right in our backyard, right? And and this is a 4,200-acre forest. Uh, and there's only ten bee trees that he was able to find in that entire area. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that he, did, he does know that there are two managed apiaries just outside this forest. So one uh, located in the northeast and one located in the southwest uh, quadrant of the Arnott Forest. And these are known to him. Um, and so really the question was, um, are these bees living in the trees? Are they genetically distinct from these bees that are living in the boxes? immediately adjacent. 
or are they somehow intermingling genetically? So it's, again, it's getting to that question of are they are not bees? Are they survivor stock? Are they survivors, or are they just escaped swarms inhabiting uh, the forest from you know the the beekeepers that are that are immediately adjacent to it? Uh, in doing this, um, we also, you know, we sampled the bees, and this is where uh, uh, Debbie Delaney uh, comes in as, as a geneticist, where she was running the genetics of these bees that were captured um, from these different bee trees. Um, and so uh, one thing that we asked was, um, are the queens that are heading these ten colonies uh, are they mating with an adequate number of drones? Um, because obviously it's a very sparse population. Uh, compared to these managed honeybee colonies, um, what's the mating numbers of these queens? Because you would think there would be fewer drones and therefore the queens don't mate as much. Uh, but one thing that we found was that the queens in the Arnott forests were actually mating just as many times um, as these managed bees. So um, I apologize, I lost the x-axis here, but the, the left-hand bars here are the um, mating numbers for the r not bees, and then these are the uh, mating numbers for the queens from the two apiaries. Um, and they were not uh, different from each other. So queens out in the middle of nowhere still seem to find enough mates and mate with uh, the drones uh, so that they um, they are not deplete of uh, of having enough sperm, being able to lay the eggs and fertilize the eggs uh, as they move forward, which is a bit surprising given how remote they were. But again, the real question is: um, Are the feral bees genetically distinct from the managed bees? Um, and the answer to that, uh, based on on a publication that came out earlier this year, um, was a resounding yes. Uh, so this graph, it's a very colorful graph, but um, it pretty much it shows kind of the genetic distinction between the different populations. So uh, the one in the red here is uh, the, kind of the genetic signature, shall we say, of the Arnott bees. That is uh, completely different from the bees in the first apiary uh, and mostly different from bees in the second apiary. And so in other words, what this is really suggesting, a very stark contrast of the genetic signature of these different populations. So um, are feral honeybees are in the Arnott forest genetically distinct from uh, those that we have in our boxes? And the answer is absolutely yes. Now another thing that Tom did, this was not with us, but with another collaborator, where he went back to some of the bees that he had in 1970. That this is a webinar cars. from NC State with Dr. Yeah, with Dr. David Tarpey. Uh, can you mute your microphone, please, as um, as you're on, so that uh, um, as we can hear you. Thank you. Um, so he was able to compare the bees before Varroa and the bees after Varroa in the same location. And pretty much what he found, uh, him and his researchers, his uh, collaborators found, was that they uh, are indeed distinct, so that there was a there's been a genetic change in the bees uh, from before Varroa to today. And so they, they seem to have gone through a genetic bottleneck because of Varroa, which makes a lot of sense, because when Varroa came, they were wiping out colonies left and right, and it was thought for a long time that the feral honeybees were all extinct. Um, but what this is suggesting is that it's not. What happened, what seems to have happened, was that the question of whether these feral honeybees are survivor stock or escape swarms, the answer is really that they're both. <laughs> what happened was that um, the original feral population pretty much got wiped out or close to it by the varroa mite, but then the escape swarms from our boxes reestablished the feral population and they have since adapted and have since changed genetically so that they are distinct from our um, managed bees that we tend to, to use uh, day in and day out. So it really gives a lot of hope of studying the feral bees because you know, now we know that they're not just the same bees in our boxes, they just happen to swarm. 
we know that they are genetically different, so they may have something to offer. So there's a question here about how far will drones range to, to a drone congregation area. Um, that's a really um, interesting and important question where we really don't know the, the answer to it. Um, I think with the transponder technology and the harmonic radar um, uh, ability that we have today, we maybe start to, to get to that answer. Uh, but the current thinking is that drones don't tend to fly as far as queens do. Queens actually fly further from the hive a mile or two miles away in order to find drones from far away, and drones tend to stay a little bit closer. Um, now, that it really depends on location and lots of other factors in the environment, but, but in general, um, it's the queens that fly, fly further than the drones do. Um, but they both can fly, you know, um, several miles away from the colony if needed. And that's all to avoid inbreeding, right? Because the queens, they don't want to mate with their brothers. So queens and drones from the same hive would prevent, uh, would cause a lot of severe um, genetic inbreeding, and they don't want that. That's obviously uh, not good for bees. Okay, so um, so that's bees living in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York, and so they clearly have, have been shown to be a, a, a distinct genetic population and, and may have something to offer. But, you know, how do the feral bees interacting with our managed bees in urban centers? Uh, and so this is where um, Holden's work and then subsequently Margarita's work has really picked up, where um, we're, we're trying to address a lot of those different questions. And so um, we're looking at both managed and feral bees in the triangle area. Um, this is in large part thanks to uh, cooperating beekeepers in uh, the Wake County uh, Beekeepers Association and surrounding uh, clubs, as well as um, the citizen science um, project called Save the Hives, which was started by uh, Ronnie Bouchon, who's a Wake County beekeeper, um, who is using Google Map technology to allow beekeepers and interested citizens to plot on a map where their um, where they find feral honeybee colonies. So bees not living in boxes, but living in trees and other places. And so Holden went through that map, and he was able to locate uh, many different feral nests in across the entire urban gradient of the, the triangle area. Um, and so in sampling those things, he sampled um, feral colonies. And of course, because of the wolf pack, we had to use, you know, different types of dogs, right? So you have feral colonies, the wolf. Then you have um, these experimental colonies that he set up himself. So he had four experimental colonies, uh, sorry, 12 experimental colonies in total. And then domesticated or, you know, managed colonies, like this cute little puppy here, um, from cooperating beekeepers. But then he uh, sampled those colonies across the urban gradient. So we sampled, he had some colonies that were right downtown Raleigh or Durham. There were others that were in the suburbs, so kind of in, intermediate, and then uh, several out in uh, very rural areas. Right? So he had, uh, across the entire urban spectrum, he had feral, experimental, and uh, um, managed honeybee colonies. And then from those colonies, what he did as he sampled with a sweet net, he sampled the forager bees that were coming back to their to their colonies. Now, of course, he couldn't go inside these bees that were living in trees. Uh, while well, he could have done that with the bees living in the boxes, because he couldn't do it in the trees, he wanted to keep it all the same. So he just took a sweet net and he sampled uh, returning foragers coming back to the nest. And he brought them back into the, um, into the lab, and he did a series of different tests on them to try to understand their physiology and their immune systems. So um, just one of the many things uh, that he did, he kind of did this non-destructive means of looking at how quickly bees respond to a foreign invading object. And so what you can do without killing the bees or hurting them is you can insert a nylon probe um, 
into uh, the abdomen of the bee. And what happens is that over about four hours, the bee's uh, immune system will recognize that probe as a foreign, in foreign invader. And what it does is it, it starts encapsulating, attacking it with like the white blood cells, right, of the bee's blood. And it, it darkens the probe where um, it's trying to, um, to attack this foreign invader. And so what this probe then looks like after four hours is that it's significantly darkened, um, which is indicative of how strong an immune response that the bees had towards that. And so Holden is a very standard technique that Holden employed here so that he could measure and gauge the level of immune response of these different bees. He also then um, uh, ground up the DNA of these bees and he looked at different diseases. So we looked at a whole suite of different uh, important honeybee uh, viruses. So these are probably viruses that um, you've seen um, in the literature and talking about uh, at different beekeeper meetings. Um, there's also a whole webinar that was recorded um, uh, last year about uh, the different honeybee viruses. So if you uh, want more information about go those, go check those out. But we also tested for um, other known pathogens like American fowl brood, uh, Nosema apis and Nosema serrana, so those gut parasites. And then we also looked at um, different immune uh, measures of antimicrobial uh, proteins, these things that are part, again, a different part of the bee's immune system of, of attacking different um, uh, microbes in the bee's system. So um, looking at kind of these genes that are getting turned on or off as a result of, of being sick. And so what uh, he found, again, this is um, in, uh, uh, Holden's co-advisor, Steve Frank, um, is that we found that there was a lot more variation in this immune response, this grain of the probe um, of the bee's immune system naturally attacking this, um, this probe. We found a lot more uh, variation within the colonies, that is from uh, one bee to another bee within the same colony, than we saw across the urban landscape or as a result of feral versus managed colonies. So there was no real major effect of urbanization uh, or management on this measure of immunity. So um, it doesn't look like by keeping bees in boxes, we're making our bees more prone to be sick or less prone to be sick. Um, and it doesn't look like if you keep bees in the city or out in the uh, rural areas that um, that's really having much of an effect on their ability to fight off infection either. Now that said, when we look at an overall landscape analysis, and this is where uh, Margarita and Elsa's contributions uh, to this um, really took this to the next level um, through some very, very sophisticated uh, analyses that I won't even try to go into and explain this figure at all. But suffice it to say that the take home messages from this are that uh, the pathogens of, that were measured by these, uh, by these colonies increase with both urbanization and with management. So uh, there seem to be uh, more viruses and um, the nosema levels um, in managed bees compared to feral bees and in urban areas compared to uh, rural areas or suburban areas. Um, now associated with that is that the feral bees seem to have their immune genes turned on they were kind of at a heightened level compared to the managed bees. So they had a higher immune response of these antimicrobial peptides compared to bees living in our boxes. Um, you know, that said, uh, this effect of urbanization that was seen in the disease didn't seem to be linked with immunity. So other than feral bees being um, kind of heightened, jacked up in their immune response, Managed versus feral bees um, uh, didn't have uh, uh, as much of, of an effect. And so instead, what is more likely an explanation of some of this pattern is that bees living in the city may have um, a higher propensity to transmit 
or that they're, um, the different bugs that infect them, um, they have an easier time in making the bees sick compared to uh, bees living out in the rural environments. So there may be issues dealing with uh, landscape and with diet. There could be issues dealing with temperature. Uh, we're not really sure yet, but knowing that these trends are here, that it's not that we're making bees more prone to be sick, but bees living in the city may have higher levels of disease um, is important to know so that we can um, adjust our beekeeping uh, regimens accordingly. There's another question here um, about the mosquito uh, sprayers. Um, oh, okay, that's asking for at the end of the, in the discussion period. So we'll open that up and talking about um, uh, yeah, this other important issue, we didn't measure any issues dealing with pesticides or um, how likely they were um, going to encounter uh, different um, environmental contaminants in their, in their uh, surroundings. We're just looking at where they were located. Now, importantly, as you might realize, we're looking at um, urban, suburban, and rural landscapes we were not looking at agricultural landscapes because it's actually pretty difficult to, to, to place them across a gradient. We're not really sure where to place agriculture along that gradient. So we kept the agricultural areas out of this uh, particular study. That's a good point. I'll try and bring that up at the end. So uh, to put these two things together, so again, these are multiple projects with different collaborators, but a lot of overlap dealing with these issues of, of feral living versus managed um, and uh, urban living versus rural uh, living when it comes to the bees. Um, and, and the conclusion so far along this uh, research paradigm is that urbanization is not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but it may be pointing towards urban areas and beekeepers in urban areas may have a, a heightened issue dealing with disease compared to those living out uh, in the country. But overall, because there are pros and cons to both living in the city and in the country, um, a lot of these things can cancel each other out. So more work is needed for that. Um, that said, the genetic evidence really strongly suggests that feral bees are these readapted escape swarms from our boxes that are genetically distinct and therefore may have something to offer our managed bees. Can we harness some of the um, adaptations that they may have uh, acquired at living in the wild successfully and can we co-opt those genetic changes into our managed bees so that our bees can have the same benefit. Um, and then finally, uh, the feral colonies, even though they do have uh, lower disease burdens and they have heightened immunities, knowing how that works, what are the factors that are responsible for feral bees to be able to fight off infections better, um, that may help illuminate ways that we can improve our management um, so that uh, our bees in our boxes can have the same, the same benefits. And so uh, with that, um, before we open it up to questions, I just want to remind you of our next uh, scheduled webinar is uh, in the middle of January, this time hosted by the Guilford County Beekeepers. So thank you, uh, Guilford County Beekeepers, for that. We haven't decided on the topic yet, but uh, in the middle of winter, I'm sure we'll have a lot of thinking to do getting ready for the next spring. So um, we will uh, keep posted on announcing that later. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So OK, um, let me get to this one, and then, uh, then we'll discuss the mosquito spraying uh, programs that are going on. So uh, what effect can be attributed to the fact that urban bees live in higher concentrations, right? That is more hives in smaller areas as opposed to rural bees. So that's an important point and something that um, I think is, is very germane to this in the sense that in the, in the Arnott forest at least, they were really spread out, right? Now we didn't do any disease measures of the Arnott bees and I really wish we had um, and I'm trying to talk Tom into doing just that. Um, but uh, in, in Holden's study, in the Margarita study, um, the, the concentration, the density of the hives is much higher, 
clearly in, in the urban areas. But, you know, you, you've been to, to bee yards out in um, rural areas where they have 100 colonies sitting in one place, right? So you can have artificially dense areas even in rural landscapes as well. So I think it would be very interesting to do a compare and contrast of that because I think you may be onto something there that the reason why we're seeing the higher prevalence of diseases in urban areas could be because of that density factor, but that's something that we need to experiment and manipulate. So um, we'll get to this, uh, let's talk about this uh, mosquito sprayers um, at, uh, in, in backyards. So this is a, um, a trend that is increasing where we have these automatic um, spray systems that spray um, insecticides to help lock down um, uh, mosquito populations. The problem is, of course, is that um, what's really good at killing off a mosquito, as far as a pesticide goes, is usually pre pretty good at killing off uh, a non-target insect, such as honeybees. Uh, and so this is where kind of the interface of the two different interests of neighbors can really uh, come to a head. Um, and so the uh, main issue that um, that this brings up is communication. And having your neighbors know about your bees and where they're located and trying to work together and, and working on the, uh, the landscape, um, the, the actual pesticide applicators, I think, is critically important as well. Because a lot of times the neighbor could know, but they're not home or around or they're, they're not um, dictating to those that are actually applying the pesticide or um, if it's these automatic sprayers as well. Um, now part of a new um, uh, group of um, spearheaded by Debbie uh, Hambrick at the Farm Bureau, uh, made up of, of members of NC State and uh, particularly the State Department of Agriculture, um, there, there's all, a lot of new efforts trying to um, get a lot of new information and literature out there uh, for landscape uh, practitioners as well as homeowners to try and mitigate a lot of these problems. There's no easy solution to this, obviously, um, but the effort of this is to try and um, increase communication. Now that said, the, um, the new EPA regulations that are coming down are being imposed on uh, labels of different pesticides are going to great lengths to try to improve and to uh, minimize the exposure to honeybees. So whereas before it may be said on a particular pesticide or insecticide label, don't spray around honeybees when they're actively foraging, now it's in much clearer language, it's right up front, it has a, a honeybee icon and it's much more prevalent. Um, and so anybody that has a pesticide applicator's license is going to be trained in how to avoid um, spraying bees or uh, exposing, otherwise exposing bees. Um, and it's going to be a, a lot more, uh, um, there's going to be a heightened awareness uh, from the applicator side. But that doesn't, um, you know, dismiss the, the role that we have as beekeepers aware as well in making sure that people are aware and educated about the location and the importance of our bees as well. So trying to get that dialogue going, I think, has is, is always been really hard. And these, um, these uh, especially the automatic spraying systems and stuff, um, it, 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 uh, um, it introduces problems that really weren't there before. So I uh, just continue to stay very um, uh, neighborly, but uh, also very uh, vocal about uh, the importance of your bees. So there's a question here about uh, saying that feral colonies in rural areas are now naturally varroa resistant. So that's, um, that's a very good point, and I, I meant to make it, but I didn't. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that they're naturally resistant, but it does open up the possibility that there are that they are. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, beekeepers that I know that, that like to raise queens from bees that they catch in the middle of the forest, and they're making the supposition that those uh, genetics are immune to varroa mites. And um, that's possible, and it's certainly, I think, a very testable hypothesis, but if they're not genetically distinct, 
from the bees in our boxes, then they can't be. <laughs> they must be um, surviving for some other reason. But the fact that we're showing that these populations are genetically distinct, now we can move to the next step and say, okay, is it really about them being resistant uh, genetically to, uh, to varroa mites, or is it because they're living in smaller colonies? They're swarming a lot, so they're purging their mites more frequently. Is it because they're not close to each other and they're living far apart from each other, so they're not spreading the varroa mites as much? Is it because the varroa mites are nicer and kinder mites uh, because in, in the middle of the woods, if you're a parasite and you kill off your host, you're dead too. Whereas in a cluster and clumped apiary in, you know, in the middle of the city, if you kill off your host, then you can just fly to the next colony over and you can reinfest that host as well. So there's a lot of other explanations as to why bees may be persisting in the feral uh, areas in light of them still having varroa. But if they weren't genetically different from the bees in our boxes, then there's no point in going any further, right? So this is a first of several steps to see if that really is something that we can co-op. It's not a given, however. That's a great question. So Surrey County here asked um, about uh, the summer losses and new research related to learning more about why we're seeing an increase in summer losses. Yeah, so the, the Bee Informed Partnership um, has been doing these surveys for the last eight years, as you well know, um, being members of that, of that group, although not um, inherently involved in that survey uh, effort as part of that group. Uh, but it became pretty clear several years ago that just looking at the winter losses uh, was not capturing all of the colony losses throughout the year. So they started adding um, a, a summertime loss uh, survey question to those annual surveys as well. And I uh, strongly, strongly encourage you to take uh, advantage of this Be Informed Partnership and to be actively involved in it. Um, the numbers are, are pretty disturbing, you know, upwards of, of uh, losses of 50%. I think North Carolina had something like 42% annual loss last year. Um, really much, much higher than what can be sustained for the long term. Um, the actual reasons that underlie that are still the same ones that we've been talking about for the last 10 years, this interaction of varroa mites and the viruses that they are transmitting. And they are often asymptomatic, but they can still result in ill health. Um, so, you know, th those types of things, nutritional issues, making sure the bees are well fed and they have adequate forage. So this is why, again, looking at urbanization is important so that we can try to understand what that minimum density is of having bees in a particular area. And then, of course, again, pesticides and these other elements that they're coming up with or they're picking up in their environment that can also stress them out and make them sick. All of these things seem to be interacting uh, with one another. Um, so it's a very complex mix of, uh, of why the bees are dying off. The good news of all of this is that the, the trend doesn't seem to be getting markedly worse or markedly better. Um, it seems to be fairly steady. So whatever is going on, it's not changing for the worse. I don't know if that's good news or not, but um, uh, research is still ongoing with that. So another question here about uh, relating to the mosquitoes. Um, uh, the, the dunk product that goes into rain barrels, uh, harmful if those water uh, supply hive. Um, it really depends on the pesticide, right? So, um, you know, any chemical can be uh, problematic for bees or for us. It just depends on the dose and on the concentration uh, and how often it's exposed. Um, but typically, if you're trying to kill off insects, those chemicals tend to be highly toxic to bees. Um, as well, and so uh, having a, a barrel or something like that that's contaminated with some of these uh, pesticides that can be uh, very, very harmful at, um, you know, parts per, per million, parts per billion, um, it, it should be avoided. And in fact, again, the new label requirements and restrictions on these different pesticides saying that those who use these pesticides, they need to take honeybees and these um, un unintended consequences of exposure to bees 
into effect where they can be held liable. So that's, um, uh, again, the last webinar that we had was um, uh, the guest lectures by, um, by Wayne Bueller here in the uh, horticulture department and Pat Jones in the NCBA went over that really, really well. And I encourage everybody to, to stay up to date on these changing labels from the regulatory side of things. Any other questions? Okay, um, I think I'm just going to end the recording here, although I, I won't uh, hang up entirely, but um, I'm going to end the recording here and we can continue the conversation. But thank you again, Surrey County Beekeepers, for hosting, as well as all the other um, clubs that uh, joined us tonight. Thank you again.